Mr. Macedonia and Apia legend, and the 1979 top goal scorer, none other than the great Gary Ward. Welcome, Gary. Oh, thanks, Sasha. That's a nice intro. Thanks so much. Pleasure. So tell us, Gary, how did you fall in love with our great game? Well, I, I'm just I'm just like any European boy. Um, you know, football was everything that you ever did. I mean, you didn't want, I mean, even in the summertime, you didn't play cricket. You basically just played five a side or four games with your mates. You know, even in the wintertime, you scrape the ice off the tarmac and create little five a side games. Use an orange ball, you've got the snow and you've got the ice around, a bit of moon, and just play until, you know, I mean, it's already dark at four in the afternoon, but you play until about eight, you know, after school, before school. It's like, you know, what, what else is there to do? You just love football, you just play it. You play it with your mates all the time. In fact, in our village, we had so many good footballers. Um, you know, there's, there's a handful that really could have gone on and, and done extremely well. I, I, I guess I was one of them, but there was others that just wanted to stay and play locally, but they had the, had great ability. And I suppose um, you, you're, you're growing up in a culture where football is, is part of the ethos of the community. It's the, when did you, when did you recognise um, that your, your junior ability um, was sort of that little step ahead of maybe the others and this could continue on? Um, I, I think I was quite fortunate. I had a, an uncle who um, was a mad Luton Town, Manchester United. Um, he wasn't that, wasn't that much older than me, maybe 15 years older than me, my mum's much younger brother. And he was really quite a talented footballer but felt that, you know, it wasn't going to happen to him. So, you know, he, he would have me just kicking the ball up against the wall with my right foot how to come on to it, how to come back, how to come on to it, um, how to turn around and come on to it. But he sort of coached me from four until I was about six with my right foot, just assumed I was right footed. So the brain had got trained to kick with the right foot. However, it wasn't until I sort of was at school and, you know, playing a bit of cricket and I had to hold the bat left handed. And all of a sudden I'm realizing that pretty much everything I do is left handed. So once the ball got on the left side, I, I thought, well, that's really, that feels so comfortable. Um, but I've been trained but basically that sort of four to six just to kick the ball with my right the whole time. So therefore, I was actually naturally a left-footed player. So hence I played left wing or left midfield or I scored a lot of goals on my left foot. So really there wasn't much I couldn't do with either foot. Yeah, you know, if you know what I mean. I, I never ever once took a competitive penalty with my left. I always took it with my right because it was more accurate, but my left was dangerous. I mean, I could hit a volley or do anything, bend it, chip it, you know, good pass or whatever. I mean, you know, I, I just felt lucky. That's why I kind of laugh when I hear people say, oh, it was on his wrong side. It was on his wrong foot. Yeah. You know, and even in the English Premier League today, I mean, and there might be, a, oh, it just came to the, it came to his weaker side. And I thought, bloody hell, I mean, you know, weak aside, what is all your full-time professionals? There can't be a weak aside. But anyway, so, you know, and, I, I... I suppose the um, uh, sort of testimony to those who... Um, because f football has changed a little bit, you know, the, the unorthodoxy of the young players going out and just kicking a ball on the street or being by yourself and kicking against the wall... This is where you develop your craft, you know, um, by playing on the on the streets with your friends, and um, you, you you commenced into uh, school football or junior football. Tell us about those times. Well, I guess when you when you go to school, um, you know, as a primary school kid, you you can play against other primary schools. It's you know, villages in Bedfordshire. There's only a mile mile or two between most of the villages, so it's not that wasn't too difficult at that age. But when you go to the secondary school, when you go to high school, basically, um, you know, you've got maybe 15 or 20 villages and a couple of towns that all go to coaches to the one high school. So it's very competitive then, you know. Um, so to get in the first team of your year was something that, you know, basically I, you know, they, tr they trialed, you know, school said, okay, who wants to play football? And so I'm, I'm down there. And I just tore everybody to shreds. 
you know, I just, just went around them and they said, well, okay, well, you can certainly play in the team. But again, there were, you know, so I ended up playing for Bedfordshire as well, but there were, there were three or four guys in, 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 my, um, in my high school in um, first team. I mean, we went all the way through from, you know, 12 year olds, 13, 14, 15, 16, but about 14, we started playing for Bedfordshire as well, which means you played against other counties. So it sort of lifted the bar in terms of the competitiveness uh, of the people you were boys you were playing against, and also you kind of felt a bit special when you're on a coach and you've got your kit bag in the back and with the other boys and you're you know you're travelling to White Hart Lane to play yeah. Middlesex, you know. So you're on Spurs' ground. I mean, there's no one in there, but you know the fact that you've actually come up from the underground um, to the main level. And the first thing you see is this big three-story stand at White Hart Lane. You go, shit, I can't wait to play here when it's full. I mean, so, you know, um, but yeah, look, look, we, we all, I mean, I used to, in my village, I, I lived near the school and uh, there was a school wall. And I used to just chalk circles and put A, B, C, D and everything else. And then just practice with the right and practice with the left, just bending it. Can I bend it into there? Can I bend it into there? To try and hit those circles from different angles and then driving it from the front. And then, you know, the football posts are always up in the village, the goal posts. And so basically you throw a rope over the crossbar with a, with a tyre and, uh, you know, you on the edge of the box, you're just practising to see if you can get it through. Um, you know, so you... And you're just doing it all day. So basically, it's like, you know, who needs an apprenticeship? This is it. And then I used to put posts in the corner. So here's the goal. I put a post in the corner about two foot from the actual goal post itself on both ends. And then just practice trying to hit those corners with mm. the left and the right for hours. So, I mean, by the time you got to 14, you, you were pretty useful, you know, if you, if you had that, that natural ability to do that. And I, you know, I was bad at a lot of things, but I was quite a good, I was quite good at football. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Those, those principles, it, it doesn't matter who the, the keeper would be. If you can put it, you know, a foot or two away from the post, it's going in, right. Especially if you can do that uh, live in the game, obviously uh, being stationary is the first part of uh, practicing, but this, this mm. uh, frames that idea that then puts you on to becoming uh, a prolific goal scorer. So that's uh, that's uh, nice. But I find I find the A League, you know, when when the game opens up for somebody and they're sort of looming up on the edge of the box, and you can see there's an opportunity to shoot, and and they they do or they don't, and if they do, they often just either blast it over the top, or they hit it at the goalkeeper. And I'm just thinking, why don't you just take that extra second that you've got? You know you've got it. You've always got a little bit more time than you think you have. If you just get composed, just a little bit of composure at that particular time, you could end up scoring 25 goals a season, but you end up... So tell us, you, you're going through your, your high school um, and you're playing for now your, your, your county. Um, when is it that you make your uh, first senior debut? Um, okay, well, I, I left school at 16, um, so I didn't finish school. So, you know, that doesn't make me stupid. But um, there was, I had an opportunity to, you know, to play full time as an amateur because you if you're if you're not 18, you can't sign as a professional. At least you couldn't, and I don't know what it, what it is now. And my my um, my dad, you know, we got a bit of a farming background and he really didn't want me. He just said, you know, well, you could at least get yourself a real job if you were going to leave school or whatever. Um, and, um, yeah, he didn't think that playing football was a real job, even though I was getting £28 a week, which, you know, was, was good money, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So I got, I got an opportunity to play for crew. Um, and it was basically just somebody that knew of me who said this boy's got a bit of ability? And next thing, I'm on a I'm on a train from Bletchley to Crewe, um, and the manager was Harry Gregg. I didn't know that Harry, that the famous Harry Gregg, Manchester United goalkeeper from the Busby Babes. And all, I had no idea. All I knew was this, this guy was the was the manager, and he had an Irish accent, <laughs> and that was it. 
and they uh, they so they they lined me up to play a couple of two or three friendly games. And the first one was in what they called the Lancashire Floodlit League. Now I'm I'm from Bedfordshire, and this is miles away. I might as well be another planet. Um, everyone's you know everyone spoke with a different accent completely. Anyway, but bottom line was we were playing against Liverpool reserves on a Wednesday night at Cruise Ground, which is right near the railway station. And in that Liverpool reserves team in the, in the, the Lancashire floodlit league game was um, Jimmy Case and was Fairclough and, and some of those sorts of players that when they didn't know they were going to go on and be big stars, which they ended up being big stars. But, but in that particular game, I didn't have the right footwear. The ground was heavy. My studs weren't long enough. I wasn't just wasn't getting into the game. And probably 20 minutes had gone past. And I had absolutely no, not one touch of the ball. And they were one up. They, they'd scored and they were one up. And so when I got the ball, I just got greedy. Um, I took the ball with my left, pretended to shoot, went left again, pretended to shoot, went left again. And the angle wasn't great. And the ball was quite heavy, but I just hit the thing with my left on this angle. And it really could have gone, it could have gone anywhere, but it went right into the top right-hand corner. Like I just went, it was shit. And one of the one of the, my teammates that I didn't even know them said, mate, if you can score goals like that, you're in. You know what I mean? And I thought, and I went, right, okay, well, obviously I can score goals like that. And as it turned out that day, that night, I scored all three goals in a 3-3 three, three draw. And you never know how you're going to score. Like, for instance, this is when a, a, a fullback could kick the ball back to the goalkeeper and he could just pick it up. Do you know what I mean? Um, so um, it was like the 89th minute. We were 3-2 down. And I'm, I've been raring to go ever since. So, I'm, I'm you know, the keeper, rolled, the keeper throws it out to the fullback. The fullback, I'm in on the fullback, closing his angle down, showing him the line so he can't go back to the goalkeeper and waste time. And so he pretends to play it up the line and he cut back inside and he knocked it back to the goalkeeper, except the ground was heavy and the, <laughs> and the, and the ball the ball didn't get. And I was onto it and I just flicked it around the goalkeeper and just put it into an empty net. It couldn't have been a more gifted goal, but it was just, you know, I was poaching. I was hungry. I was everything else. So, um, so they ended up signing me and I stayed there and, so that was kind of answering your question, my first sort of at another level outside of county. Yeah. So um, we, I suppose you're starting to feel like you're, you're becoming a footballer, the um, playing uh, sort of outside of your comfort zone. So a great story. Yeah. Put the three, three, uh, all three goals, Gary Wall, well done. But I, I, it wasn't, I never felt uncomfortable. In fact, the more important the game, the better I played. The bigger the crowd, the better I played. Um, you know, it, when, if, um, you know, it, even in Australian football, um, you know, by cup matches, um, I scored a lot of goals in cups. They're, they're not necessarily registered as league goal, but well, they're not league goals. So you say, how many games did I play and how many, how many goals did I score? I look at the NSL, I look at the state league or whatever it was, and I go, well, that's, that's still at an average of about 20 a season, which is not bad. Mm. But, when you, but when you take into account um, the cup matches, so, for instance, Preston Macedonia played Tasmanian White Eagles. They played that game at, at, um, at Middle Park, at South Melbourne Hellas' ground, and I scored four. Um, I look at the Doherty Cup final when I'm playing for Melbourne Croatia against Preston Macedonia. It's 2-0 to Melbourne Croatia. I got them both. Uh, and so on. I'm just looking at the Buffalo Cups. Um, you know, I got an award with a ball and a big trophy like this. And I think Laurie Schwab presented it to me. Top goal scorer in the Buffalo Cup with nine goals. Mm. I mean, they're, they're not registered as, as goals. I'm just thinking, if you look at the overall, you know, I think that I scored a goal every two games I played anywhere, at any mm. level. Mm. If I played 20 games, I scored 10 goals. If I scored, played 30 games, I scored 15 in a season. And sometimes I, I look at those press and I know that... Um, I think I got 19 league goals in the state league for Preston the first year. And I think Carl Gilder got 18. So I think that, that's where I got that top goal scorer. But I also scored 13 cup matches for Preston, mm -hmm. 13 goals in cup matches. And um, so I got over 30 goals in my first season for Preston. And there was this article in the Truth newspaper that came out on the Thursday. It said, Preston ride a shooting star. And it was written by Fred Villiers. It was a whole two pages about 
me. Yeah. And I and I had no idea what the Truth newspaper was or anything. And someone said, "Oh, have you seen that article of you in the Truth?" And I said, "What Truth? The, the the newspaper." So I went and bought it. I went, "Holy shit!" You know, I mean, like I, I didn't, yeah, I didn't know, but I, you know, I, but also, you know, it's not your, your job of scoring or in the build up or getting down the wing. I was watching some old Preston games that are finding their way to the Facebook, which is kind of nice. And I saw me going down the right wing and chipping the ball over for Claude Lacazie. I saw me going down the left wing. And I'm just thinking it was really gloves off, wasn't it? You know, we just, you know, that Preston side of 82 and maybe 83 with some amazingly good players like Zarka Ojikov um, and uh, Alan Whittle, who played for Everton. But Alan Whittle came to play. In fact, Peter Ollerton said, we've got someone coming in the midfield that's... that's um, that's, got, that's going to play, you know, there's Richard Miranda um, and there was like there was some midfield. This is before Georgie Campbell and that, then it became a super side in 83 because they've just got Ojikov and, and everything else. But they got Alan Whittle for, you know, I said, what, the same Alan Whittle that played 250 games for Everton in the mm. English First Division? Yeah, that Alan Whittle. I said, well, he's not that old. Yeah, he's 31. He's coming out to play for Preston Macedonia for a season. I went, wow. Okay. Now, you, you might look and say, well, Today, that would be classed as a high-profile marquee player, but that was just, yes. that was just Preston Sarka Ojikov. That was just, you know, you've got, you got, got these players and, and, and Alan Evans, who played for Liverpool, uh, played for Liverpool, was playing for South Melbourne Hellas when I arrived. I went, that's Alan Evans, who played for Liverpool like 200 times. Do you know what I mean? I mean, so there were really good players around. And if Preston, if Preston and Peter Catholis and I do talk about this particular game, but Preston would go up to play against Sydney Olympic. And we talk about crowds and we talk about the NPL and we talk about the A-League and everything else. And I watch an A-League game and I just think it's a shame there's not the passion there was when the, when the National Soccer League was in because Preston would come up to play again. They played it at Belmore because Pratton Park couldn't hold the sort of crowd that they were expecting. And there was at least 10,000 people at Belmore. Um, and the game finished 2-2. Chris Calantis and Peter Cathola scored. Claude Lacazie and I scored in the Bertuno down at half time. It was 2 2. Claude and I scored in the second half. And we talk about that game and say, you know, there was police on horseback. There were 10 plus thousand people there. There were people just waving all their stuff. They were chanting and singing. And whether it was, whether it was Olympic or Marco Dani, it didn't matter. The yeah. fact is, they were chanting, they were singing, they were passionate. There was atmosphere. The surfaces that we played on were not great. And we were, we were, we were skillful. And I just thought, you know, I mean, Luton Town versus Leighton Orient would get 7,000 people and, and Sydney Olympic versus Preston Macedonia gets 10,000 people. And there's equally as much passion and, and atmosphere in that game as there was in an English second division game. Do you know what I mean? And I, and I go up and I watch Central Coast. Oh, sorry, I'm going off. I go up and watch Central Coast Mariners and I enjoy watching Central Coast Mariners because he's because Statutes has got them getting to the byline and cutting the ball back. He's getting the ball delivered into the box and getting numbers in there. And when it breaks down, he's getting them back behind the ball. And they're really, really mobile. He's got them motivated. He's got them fit. He's got them mobile. He's got them in a positive frame of mind. And they're top of the league. And they've got the lowest wages bill, right? And Oliver Bazanich is having a field day because, no, he, I don't know if Oliver, uh, I mean, I used to play with Vic Bazanich, his dad, right? But I'm watching Oliver going, mate, you're really enjoying your football. Mm. Mm. He's just so happy with it. Anyway, look, sorry, you're, you, you, you conduct the show. I'll stop. The, um, <laughs> you, you, you came to Australia in uh, 79, but you almost had a career, a footballing career before your Australian career. You, you played many years as, as, as uh, did, you, did you see that your, your, you were you almost... Were, had a, a footballing career before your Australian career? Did you did it feel like that? And describe to me those, those the, the years 76, 77, 78 before you came to Australia. Okay, well, that's that's a really good question because well, um, I ended up playing for Leighton Orient um, and um, a guy called Derek Posse who used to play for Tottenham and he played for Leighton Orient and then he, he went to... He went to play in the North American Soccer League, which a lot of players did when they got to sort of 32, 3, 4, whatever, and went and played over there. And I'm, I'm still only like, you know, 18, 19, 20, and he, well, 19. And he said to me, 
um, a young boy like you really, you know, you've got ability. Why don't you go and play North American Soccer League? I said, well, how, how would I, you know, how would I Get work there. that up? Yeah. And he said, he said, well, I, I'll, um, I'll have a word with, um, with the manager and, and tell him that, you know, we should be signing a young player like you. So out of nowhere, I'm, you know, my mum phones me and says, I've got a, I had a phone call from somebody that phoned our home. I wasn't living at home, phoned our home number. And um, he was from Canada. And, and I said, look, I'll, I'll, I'll phone Gary and get him to call you. So I ended up speaking to this guy who was um, like administration type of guy. And then, then the, um, the coach came on, um, which I think of his name was German, um, not, not Rudy Gutendorf, it was someone with a similar name. But he, um, he said, look, um, you're not going to cost us anything because you're on, you're on a free outside of the UK. So we'd like to bring you over. So I find myself flying to Vancouver um, you know, with a with a with a suitcase, and I had no idea what to expect. And you know, it was it was Vancouver. It's beautiful, and they put me into a flat in North Vancouver, just over the over the um, Lionsgate Bridge. And so I had teammates, and I had a whole different culture. I mean, there were there were you know native Indians basically with a couple of feathers in there walking on the streets. I'm just going, wow, this is like you know, and it, it, but it was true. That's like you know, that was. The, you know, the Aboriginals of Canada, basically. And, and um, so I, 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 they, they played at Burnaby. We played at Burnaby at, um, at the old original Olympic Stadium. And I ended up playing in the North American Soccer League until my knee went. Mm. I, it, at my cartilage tore. So, um, are you still there? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, so, but I, it was... Sorry. It was an experience that I just, you know, I absolutely loved. I, I had surgery. I had a, uh, you know, before keyhole surgery. So they had to cut down the outside of your knee and dig out the cartilage and stitch it all up and hopefully and put a cap on it and hopefully, you know, you'll recover. And some people didn't recover from external lateral sort of knee surgery. Um, but I did. I was back. I was back on the training path four weeks later. Um, I had a quick recovery so um but when I'm, I'm back in england and um i get a phone call from um oh who was it some guy who said i, I position players around the world mm. no i know you've been overseas did you want to go and play in hong kong south africa um, or australia and my my response to him was do they play football in australia and he said, yes, he said, there's, there's a very competitive national soccer league. He said, I can, um, um, I can, I can line you up with a team called Arpia there mm -hmm. in Sydney. And I went, okay. He said, and, and he said, you, you'll get um, about 260 um, Australian dollars a game. And he said, and the pound at the time, the pound and the dollar were, were quite close at the time. And, and I'm looking at thinking, that's, that's not bad. Um, so he he'd all, so I got this contract from Arpia and I signed it and I obviously in the post there was no internet and sent it back and then then um, they said okay you'll be flying out to you'll be flying out to Sydney in four weeks on Monday and we're going to send you a ticket in the mail in whatever right and so but also I, I was I start I was talking to John Brown for Preston mm -hmm. and. And he, I said to him, well, this is what I'm being offered in Sydney. He said, well, we can match that. Um, but I said, no, I've already, I'm already committed to play for up here in Sydney. And it was, just a, it was just pure coincidence or by default that I got a phone call about a week later from, um, uh, what was his name? Um, he, was the, he was the manager. He was the coach at Arpia. And I wrote an article um, that, that one about 19 goals in 16 games by the man Arpia didn't want was the headline in the truth. Mm -hmm. And whoever the coach was at the time phoned me and complained that it made him look silly. Mm -hmm. Right, I can't think what his name was. But anyway, and they, they said, we've run out of visa spots. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, we had allowed one for you, but we just can't get another one for you. I said, well, don't worry about it. So I phoned John Branoff and said, 
is that offer still open? He said, yes. And that's how I ended up going to Preston. But I, I didn't know that Preston um, was stately mm. because what would I, how would I know? Yes. You know, Arpia in Sydney or Preston in Melbourne and the money is the same and, you know, it's only when I got to Melbourne and they said, by the way, we play in the, in the st- Victorian State League. And I said, well, what, what does that really mean? They said, well, it means that the National League, they fly to Canberra and Adelaide and Willingong and Sydney and Brisbane and whatever. And, but we're trying to get into the National Soccer League. So we want, to, we want to get higher quality footballers to come and play at Preston so that we can win the State League a couple of times. And then we'll, be, we'll have a really good case to get into the National League. And, and I said, okay, didn't, didn't bother me. I mean, games, games in Melbourne, you know, against Melbourne, Croatia, or, you know, against Green Gully or against, um, you know, um, what's it down in the, in the, um, down the, down the peninsula? Um, Morwell Falcons. Morwell so Falcons. Yeah, yeah, Morwell Falcons. Um, yeah, and Brunswick Pro- Juventus. Brunswick you know, Juventus. And, and, then, and then you got to play a cup game against, um, South Melbourne Hellas, mm. and and that was that was something else. And they said, "What watch out for this game, Gary? That we're playing in a, in a cup match in two weeks' time on a on a Wednesday night. They'll play at Olympic Park, and there'll be ten, twelve thousand people there because it's a Greek Macedonian derby." And I went right, and he said, and the, the, "The laugh was, oh, it's all it's all to do with Alexander the Great." But yes. don't tell Heidelberg that. Don't tell don't tell the boys at Heidelberg, the Jimmy Campbells, and these guys. Right, and, and but there's this Preston Macedonia, Heidelberg Alexander, South Melbourne Hellas. So when Preston did slip into the National League, those those games, those games were phenomenal. You know, they they like they would get you know the Olympic. Sorry, at um, at Middle Park, Preston versus South Melbourne at Middle Park. Wow, like it was just rocking. Yes, it was. It was, and of course the ground was quite tight. So, you know, you go to take a throw in and, you know, you're, you're right near the crowd. But no, I really, I really enjoyed the, the five years at Preston. It was, it was great. And obviously you got the opportunity. The first year was quite, uh, the first year was quite um, instrumental. Uh, so you definitely hit the ground running, but you always um, had that ability to, to find the, the net. I think the best strikers are greedy and they want to take the shot so they they want to they want to have the the glory of taking the shot and scoring or taking the shot and missing but it's that they're cumbersome that they want the ball and i think that you were that type of player you always wanted it um but you had also had other uh good quality players you mentioned claude Lucchese also banged a number of goals next to you um and you fed off each other so you Tell us about that that combination play between you and Paul. Well, I really like four four two. I think that if you've got two good strikers um, and they can play together well, there's different different styles there because you've got Kevin Keegan and John Toshak when they're at Liverpool. So one's really good, quick feet turns, and Toshak's good in the air and holding the ball up and laying it off more Paducah style. So you get different types of, 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 uh, of strikers. Uh, two strikers' job, like Rod Brown and I at Arpia. Mm. Uh, Rally Rasic wanted to play 4-4-2. And he was right, because basically Rod and I, I was, I was more experienced. Rod was only a young, young soccer at the time. But he really enjoyed playing next to me because I could educate him at the time. But anyway, so Claude and I, well, Dougie Brown uh, played at Preston. Yes, and they, Preston sold him to South Melbourne Hellas um, and bought Claude from Brunswick Juventus. And that was a really good move because um, Claude played, I played sort of on the left side up front and he played sort of on the right side. So that was the two prong there. But we were different styles of players um, in that um, um, we, um, if you ask Claude to score a goal from 20 metres, he couldn't. But if you asked him to turn on a sixpence and put it in the corner from three, he could. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? He, mm-hmm. like, um, um, he was also good off both feet. He was good on the left and he was good on the right. He knew where the back of the net was. And I think that he and I got a nice little combination going where, you know, I know, there's, I know you're, sometimes you are greedy in the box and it is your job to, to be greedy when it suits. But 
he and I would often, if the opportunity was better for Claude, even if it looked like it was okay for me, but it was definitely better for Claude and vice versa, I'd give it to him. Do you know what I mean? And so, so we didn't have that absolute greed because mm. I knew that if I gave it to Claude, chances are he'll put it in. And in the yep. interest of the team and getting a, getting on the score sheet and, or, or pulling one back if you're one nil down or whatever, that was the most important thing. Because, you know, I mean, I, I often think, what, what, would it be, what would it be like if I'd have been a defender? You know, I mean, it's, it's almost like a thankless task, isn't it? You know, a Charlie Yankos or, a, you know, um, a Tony Henderson or these sorts of players, you know, um, because you don't really get the glory when you're a defender. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I mean, you, you get that, that that feeling of putting the ball in the back of the net is like a drug. It is unbelievable. And that you just that you can't, it's like wow. And that feeling, and then and then of course, if there's a half decent crowd there, you can just go and really sort of just just enjoy that moment. And you you feel that your whole body is lighter and your adrenaline is absolutely pumping. And your confidence levels are through the roof. I mean, there's nothing more dangerous than a, than a, a goal scorer that's just scored because he's likely to score again. You know, it's like waiting for a bus in London. You get nothing for an hour than three and five minutes. I mean, it's like that's the beauty of our, our beautiful game, isn't it? Is that it could be, you know, nil. Now people say, oh, you know, nil, nil. And yeah, but you know what? That goalkeeper made some saves. The, the, the pressure, the tension and the whole thing. And then you get two goals in the last 10 minutes of the game. You get two goals in the first five minutes. I mean, what sort of game is that? Even in ice hockey, there's, there's plenty of goals end to end to end. How, what other game is there where any time anything could happen? You know what I mean? And, and, uh, so so I should have mentioned, that was Claude and I. Sorry. <laughs> it's just... So you obviously got success in the in the state league with Preston, and, and probably uh, Preston's um, testimony to Preston coming into the to the National Soccer League, and then they brought out, uh, like you, you you rightfully said, a number of quality individuals, including Ojakov, who was playing in the Yugoslav First Division um, for. Um, uh, for Varda, um, and he mm. and I, he really, really um, added another level of quality. I, I remember him getting the ball and being able to drill it into your feet. If you didn't have a good first touch, um, it'd probably bounce off you. He, he was that accurate, and he was able to sort of shift the the, the the play as that midfield general. And I think that that um, that was a very, very good. Um, uh, Preston side, I think in 80, uh, 83. Yeah, 83. Um, you, you, you were injured, however, for the, for the uh, I think it was the, the start of the, the 82 year um, with a, 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 broken, uh, a broken leg. How did you sustain uh, that chop? Well, you know, um, I, I found that playing in the state league um, unfortunately that some of the players were just hackers um, and a player like me that should have always been playing in the national league anyway was was fair game um, and especially if I if I turned and moved off the mark quite fast they were often late with the challenge and they were late purely because they weren't good enough and so, you know, if in doubt, try and stop them any way you can. And, um, and it, was, um, it was at Olympic Park when Andy Bulliver, who was just a chopper for, for um, Sydney, for Melbourne, Croatia. I mean, he had no, no ability whatsoever. And I'm going to be critical of him because he deliberately broke my leg. I and mean, there's no attempt to play the ball whatsoever. Um, I turned, I knocked it past him, and he was like a, like a steam train. He was going to take me out no matter what. And I was slightly off balance. And all of a sudden, you know, this is at Olympic Park and, you know, you get this amphitheater effect and sound that goes crack. And, you know, and, you know, I even heard the crowd go, oh, shit. You know, because, and, I, and I, you know, I heard the crack as he came steaming into my left shin, mm. miles from the ball. Do you know what I mean? Two-footed, up in, up in, up in that area. 
And unfortunately, yeah, it did fracture it. It didn't actually dislodge it, but it cracked it all the way around. And so, you know, you needed the plaster. There's nothing you could do about it. And um, so I sort of, I came back too soon, just desperate to get back on the park. No, it's okay, it's all good. Um, and, and so I was playing against Footscray. So this is a, an NSL game, I think, at the beginning of 82 or whenever it was. And Joe Piccioni, now he didn't deliberately do it. He's quite a good player himself. Um, and, but he caught me in that same spot. Um, and Went he, again. He, it, it cracked again. And he, he said, um, he said, look, I, it was a bad tackle for me. I'm so sorry. He sent me a basket of fruit and a bunch of flowers. And he was, he felt bad about it. Not Andy Buller, I didn't hear anything from him. But, um, but unfortunately, that meant a second fracture. And then I have to read in the paper, you know, Ward's finished. You know, sort of that sort of headline. I said, you, you don't know who you're dealing with. Um, so in the end, I sort of got the fiberglass plaster on. And I went off to England. And a mate of mine who was living in Torre Molinos in Spain, I phoned him and said, can I come over? He said, yes. And I spent three or four weeks there just training on the beach with my fiberglass plaster on and um, came back at the beginning of the 83 season. And I, had to, I wasn't on contract. And I don't think Preston wanted to give me a contract until I could prove that that leg was okay. Mm. And we played a cup match, a pre-season, was it, you know, whatever, is it Buffalo Cup or is it Docky Cup, whatever it was. We were playing Melbourne, Croatia. And we won 3-1 and I scored two of the three goals. Really, mm. really, I was so fit and sharp and fast. And Johnny Gardner and Steve Short both said, you, you were way, way too good for us today, me individually. And John Brenoff, when we were walking off, came up to me and he said, I think you better sign your contract. I said, sure. You know what I mean? So I was, I was, you know, all of a sudden my leg was okay again. But, you know, I mean, today, I mean, I've got the, I've got this callus out yes. the side, you know. People don't, don't realise that when, when your leg goes into a plaster or a cast or if you have to do a reconstruction, how quickly you lose the muscle. Of mm -hmm. your leg and how how you need to to work on to build it up. You know, only you know a week of not walking and, and your leg withers away the muscle in your leg. Um, mm -hmm. How was your confidence once you, you you came back on 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 that leg? You know, it was the strength of equal weight. How, how did you compensate? Um, well, I I went to um, Barry Richardson's physiotherapy um, business in Richmond Hill. Um, where I met a few AFL players and we were just doing leg strengthening with Cybex uh, testing and everything else. So I knew that it was back to 100% each uh, because you could measure it, you know, and only when it, only when it was back to 100% each. So, uh, but I, I wore, um, I wore a, um, a pad at the front, but I also wore a pad at the back uh, just in case, just thin ones, you know, you wouldn't even know it was there just for a little bit of extra protection. Um, but when, actually, you know, your point on Zarka Ojikov, um, he didn't speak um, hardly any English. Yes. But, but, but the, the language of football is the language, so it didn't yes. matter. But when you say about him coming, coming through, he, he, he came through almost, he looked like a ball that was charging. Because yes. I'm, I'm in the forward position, so I'm looking at him, and he's coming through, and he's got the ball at his feet. And... Um, and he, um, he knocks the ball at 100 miles an hour into your feet, right? Which, you ask any forward that's got a good first touch, you want it as hard as possible. You don't want it soft. You don't want it taken. You want it in there hard. Bang, it's in there. But the beauty of Oji was that he would then make a run into some space and say, give me the ball back. Yeah, so if you can hold it up and then just lay it to him, the game opens up. So I really enjoyed my one season playing with Zarko Ojikov, it was just great fun. I would say one of the, uh, for me, um, Jaco, Oscar Crino, the, these type of midfielders, Peter Catholis, they're, they're operating at a at another level where there's goal scoring um, midfielders, you know, so people like Crino and, and Catholis who had that flair, but Jaco had an engine as well. So he, all, he could play, but he also mm. ran. A big, big engine. So, um, 
And the same with, uh, you know, Jimmy Campbell, who was, yes. a, you know, Heidelberg and, and Melbourne, Croatia. Um, you know, I, I wasn't at... I wasn't at Melbourne Croatia for very long. It was only a season and a bit, I think. But I, I scored more goals in one season for Melbourne Croatia in the cup matches than, than in any other season in Australia, just in that. So we won the Doherty Cup, the Buffalo Cup, and the Ansett Challenge Shield. So three trophies in mm. one season at Melbourne Croatia. But they had Joseph Biskic, they had Steve Gojevic, and they had Jimmy Campbell, that was kind of making up a midfield. So Biskic down the right, Goyevich down the left, Jimmy Campbell in the middle. So I got to say that they had the makings of a really good side. I enjoyed, I really enjoyed playing there. But Jimmy Campbell was very, he was a professional, you know what I mean? Um, he trained hard and he was really good at delivering the balls. He was good at encouraging players around him and educating them. So in terms of midfield, you know, obviously Ojikov and Jimmy Campbell and Peter Kofolis. In fact, I've been kind of lucky. You know, even the one season I had at Brunswick Juventus, you've got a young Paul Wade and, and yes. John Dowie and some of those sorts of players that, that were there as well. And, I mean, you know, John Dowie, who played for Brunswick Juventus, is no longer with us. You know, um, I think he passed away a few, you know, three or four years, five years ago. I'm not, not, not sure how long, but I got a bit of a shock because he was my teammate when he was my roommate when Brunswick Juventus travelled into state. Mm. But, I mean, he was a professional and also he played for Fulham. You know, and so, you know, you, you had a lot of people that had played professional football in Europe, Zarko Ojikov, and, you know, and that, that were playing in the NSL. So, you know, I was asked a question recently about how I determined the different standard of, say, today's A-League and the NSL and, in the Aces. Um, and I say, well, look, you know, Preston Magadoni had this thing with schools in the Reservoir, Preston, Thornbury area. And that was that at the end of training or, or you know, pre-season training, they would get you to go to schools and you'd get all the boys in a circle or, you know, and just and they'd practice heading it back. Some could, some could head it, some couldn't. Some knew how to head it, some had no idea. And then you sort of, you know, did a bit of coaching for them. And then if you just go forward maybe, you know, then a decade, so let's say then all of a sudden you've got this team of um of uh, Kuehl and Baduka and Aloisi and Cahill and Emerton and Neil and Swartzer and, and that, that Socceroo side, I mean, seriously, that was a really good side, wasn't it? They, should, they could have won the World Cup. I mean, they got done by Italy in that sort of funny old Neil falling over. Someone goes over him. They lose that way when they really should have won that game. I and mean, Italy win the World Cup that year and, and the Socceroos had just almost destroyed them in the third round or whenever it was. You know what I mean? So, but I think that my my um, era of players that went out and coached kids in schools and then they come through. I mean, where's today's where's where's Mark Baduka today? Where's where's the where's the soccer room Mark Baduka? Where's the where's the Harry Kuehl? You know what I mean? Mm. I just I just think it's you know it's just unfortunate. But I but the, the skill levels of the A League. Is they would, it seems to me that they would rather play the ball sideways and backwards than go forward when they can. I think uh, you move to West Adelaide um, and that same year, Charlie Yankos uh, also uh, was part of that West Adelaide side. And they brought a couple of other players in, that were probably five or six players short of um, a competitive side. Um, what was what was it like um, going across to to West Adelaide? Well, I always enjoyed playing against them because I liked Hindmarsh mm. as a stadium. It was reminded me of England because mm. it was tight and it was you know they was West Adelaide Hellas always got you know Preston Macedonia for instance versus you got the Macedonian Greek rivalry again. So Hindmarsh should be pretty full, which would, which would be good, but. So I enjoyed playing there, but um, at, at the ground. So when um, I, I didn't really expect to go to West Adelaide, um, I didn't like hopping from one club to another. Hence, I stayed at Preston for five years, and really should have stayed another five years. I, I should have just stayed because the, the '83 side was so good that they we would have been champions in '84. I honestly believe that. But anyway, um, but I got a phone call from Neil McGaffey, who was the um, 
coach at West Adelaide. As the National League had started, they'd played four games and they'd lost all four quite heavily. So he said, look, I've got the checkbook open. He said, I need to buy three players. You know, I want one at the back, one in the middle and one up front. He said, so I've already arranged to buy you. Melbourne Croatia have told me what, what they want in terms of a fee and we've already agreed to do it. Um, would you like to come and play for us? And just as a little carrot, um, we're going to sign Charlie Yankos from Heidelberg and we're going to sign Robbie Dunn as well. Mm. So we're going to have Charlie Yankos at the back, Robbie Dunn in the middle, and we're going to have you up front. They're, they're the three. And he said, and basically, you know, you can name your price, right? So I said, I said, okay, well, um, how about $12,000 for a signing on fee and four hundred a game? He said, yeah, not a problem at all. And so we we were about to play our first game. And so this I is in this is in um, 86. 86, 86. Yeah. So what would be the average wage uh, in eighty six? What uh, you know would it be half that, half that or two three hundred dollars? No, I, I I think well look at, at Arpia. I was on five hundred dollars a game, win, lose, or draw. Now fortunately, we won most of them, uh, but you know all of the players at Arpia were on $500 a game. That, mm. was a, that was the base salary for everybody, right? Yeah. So $400 a game at West Adelaide had us in the $12,000 signing off. Plus the fact that they gave me an apartment in North Adelaide to live in for free. Do you know what I mean? And they said they'd pay, they, they make, they pay my lease payments on my car. Fantastic. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I don't know where they get the money from. I don't care. I don't care. But so, and, and the first game was against Brisbane Lions at High Marsh. And, and, and the Adelaide Advertiser on the Saturday, on the back page, I um, can't think what his name was, but Neil McGackie had left and Edmund Kreft had come in as coach. Um, but on the back page, the Adelaide Advertiser it said, Ward's going to do this tomorrow. Mm. And the pitch dropped me. And I went, you know, that's a little bit unfair because, you yeah. know, what about you've got the soccer route captain at the back, Charlie Yankos, you know, why do I, why is that all the pressure loaded on me? You could say that Robbie Dunn's a soccer route, Charlie Yankos is a soccer route. Why don't you put a bit more pressure on them? Robbie Dunn's going to tear the midfield apart and provide goals up for, or whatever. But no, it was I was going to do it all right. Mm. And so that night I went, I went to bed and I'm thinking, because there's a lot of pressure. Um, and I thought of all the different ways I could score goals. Um, and at half time the next day, it was nil-nil. And I was walking up and I was getting booed. I thought, oh, okay, this, this is not going too well. And then um, we had a free kick and Robbie Dunn just said, you hang around the penalty spot. And when this comes, because Robbie was 6'3", when this ball comes over, I'm just going to head it back across the box and then you can come onto it. I said, okay. So I can't think who the captain of our side was, but he... he um, he ball right to the far post, Robbie Dunn, knocked it over, and off his head, mine, and I put it in, right? So from about the penalty spot, so I still needed a bit of work. And then about 10 minutes after that, I scored again with an overhead kick that went over everybody and just dropped it in. So we won the game 2-0, and I thought, well, I never thought of I, all the all the goals I dreamt about, those weren't two of them, mm. you know what I mean? So, but we still won it, we still won that game 2-0. And I felt I felt relieved of, about that, but we were having Robbie, Charlie, and I went out and had dinner. Um, and I said, I said to Charlie, how much signing on fee did you did you get, Charlie? He said, Well, I got what I asked for. I said, What did you ask for? He said, 30,000. And I went, What? He goes, Yeah, 30,000. I said to, to Robbie Dunn, I said, What about you? He said, 20. I thought, why did I pitch myself at 12? I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, why why did I undervalue myself? When he said, you know, name your price of this 12,000 signing on OK plus 400 a game. No, they said, yes, no problems. And Charlie's getting 30. <laughs> I mean, that was a lot of money in 86. I mean, 12,000 was a lot of money in 86. But I thought, I thought the psychology of undervaluing yourself. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. Mm. Anyway. At the, uh, yeah, so the uh, Rally Rassage, probably one, one might say the a man above his time in, uh, in 87 comes knocking and you get uh, put in that fantastic Arpia side. He really did know how to build a squad. Um, mm. and throughout his career, sort of handpicked players and, he, and he, he saw that you could do a job. 
Walk us through how, how you, you made it to Apia. But um, Charlie said, um, I'm not staying at West Adelaide, I'm going to Apia. Robbie Dunn said, I'm not staying here either, I'm going to back to Preston Macedonia. And uh, I went, no, oh, okay. Um, and he said, Charlie said, here's Raleigh's you know, phone number. I think you should give him a call. I said, I said, well, does he want another swap? He said, no, he's, he, he's already told me that he's putting a side together that's going to win the National League. Because in 1987, the, the Football Federation Australia said they wanted to go to try out first past the post, like the European model, to see if that, you know, and then have a, a top four or five cup afterwards. But we're going to go first past the post. So Raleigh's got this idea that we can probably win the league and then we'll be crowned as champions because we'll be first past the post. So I spoke to Raleigh and he said, I definitely want to buy you from West Adelaide. And I, because he said, because I've got Rod Brown from Marconi. I've got Peter Tredenick from Marconi. I've got Peter Catholic from Sydney Olympic. And he said, I've already got Terry Butler and a couple of other good players. He said, I've got Arno Batonia at the back. And, uh, and I've, you know, I've got Terry Greedy in goal. Mm. Um, and I went, wow. And he said, but, but Rod's 19. And he just, and, and your experience, if I can play a 4 4 2 and play you next to Rod, I think that will work well because I need someone who can one score goals, two, educate someone like Rod. You know, he's good in the air. I just, I see that as a good combination, Gary. And so I said, right. He said, he said uh, West Adelaide are not asking a lot of money for you. Um, so, you know, do you want to come to Sydney? I said, sure. So I, I you know, went up to Sydney and then, you know, um, uh, Michael Urakello was the was the trainer, and he said, "You know, we're gonna because I, I played against most of these guys, you know." Mm. And then and then uh, Sydney City uh, pulled out of the National Soccer League. I think Frank Lowe just said, "I've had enough of putting money in," and you know, people like Cosmina went to Sydney Olympic, but um, Arpia picked up John Paul De Marini mm. and Quality. and and, um, and Tony Pisano. So you've got Tony Pisano and Terry Greedy competing for the keeper's role. Mm. And so Terry Greedy just didn't get to play much because Tony Pisano was just too good. Mm. Um, mm. And then John Paul, Arno Batonia was a great player, played against him when he was at Newcastle, KB. Um, and we had a, a really good relationship off the path, even though we competed against each other. And Arno was really pleased that I was coming. Charlie Ancross was next to him. Mark Brown was on the right. And then they, they had this midfield of, of Terry Butler, Peter Trudenic, Peter Catholis, and another young soccer in Alex Bandalo, who was like only 19 as well with Rod, myself. They signed Hilton Phillips from Canberra City to be, be, be a fast winger. Um, so that, and Vic Bazanic. Um, and so the squad, I'm looking at the squad going, Far out. This is yeah. this is some squad. Started. A yeah. lot of competition for places, which is what you need. And um, but rally, I find rally's psychology really, really interesting because um, I'll give you an example. Arpia were like six games in, and we we had not lost. I think we'd won four and drawn two, but we were six games in, and we played Sydney Olympic at home, and it was a big crowd, and we were one nil down to a John Cosmina goal, and it was an absolute cracker. Uh, from 25 metres. It was just a cracking goal. And um, so um, we're one nil down. There's 20 minutes to go. We want to see if we can hold on to our unbeat start to the season. And I got put over the, over the you know, oh, sorry, um, we had a corner and I went to the near post and flicked it on, which is something I've done a lot in, in the past. And Charlie Ankles came in behind me on his knee and it hit him on his knee and it went in. So it's 1-1. One, one. About five minutes from the end, um, Peter Trudenic played a ball over the top. They were playing very square at the back, and I'm just hanging off them, hanging off them. The ball was chipped over, and I picked it up, and my angle was terrible. And it was like one, one chance at this. The keeper was committed, and I was out really, really wide on my left. I've got to hit it now, and I've got to hit it hard. It's got to be low. I'm just only going to hit one crack at this. The surface isn't great at Lambert Park, I can tell you. And, but I, it, it went in, and we won that game 2-1. And we, that was the seventh game. We thought we began to believe that, you know, things might be very possible. But we're playing against Mark Tony the next week. 
And Marconi were equal top of Sydney Olympic and us. They were having a good start. We were still top only by a point or two. And we're playing against Marconi. And he's got, we're looking at the team sheet at Bosley Park. And Peter to Dan, sorry, Peter Catholicson and myself, we're on the bench. Yes. And I and went, I'm going, I scored the winner. I got the bloody winner last week. This is sold out at Bosley Park. I, I want to play. And Maddie really? says, I, I've, I've got a plan for you. And Peter Catholic wasn't happy either. Oh, you know, I need to be, I need to be playing. What's going on here? Cat was having a great. So, um, 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 Frank Verena had a penalty. Tony Pisano saved it. So we began, that, and it's ten minutes into the second half. He puts Peter Catholic on. Then he puts me on. Peter Catholic scored, and I scored. And we just and we won that game too. And I just thought, okay, I I believe you, Rally. Now I just believe you. It's okay. Yes. You're you're the boss, right? He just he had us all. He had us. He had a sight that we were so desperate to get on there, mm. and he put us on at the right time. And we, we both scored that game. You can see it now. Marconi nil, Arpia two, Catholic scored, and yeah, it's you know, from eighty seven. So yeah, Rally was the master. Very, very influential in to our game. So, um, tell us of you. You played in many sides, and you had you played with many great players. Um, you would have shared uh, a number of rooms uh, with who? Who were the who were the players that you were closest with? Um, that you shared greatest memories, and maybe your friends uh, till today. Well. Um, I go to Melbourne every year for the Billy Whiteside Cup, um, wherever they play that. Um, and well, as I say every year, I've been, I've been to three now. So I catch up, I'm catching up with, with you know, Gary Cole and Jimmy Campbell and, and you know, all, all that and, and Brooksy and the whole crew of, of really, really great guys. Um, but um, I'm really good friends with Archie Fraser. Um, and well, Archie was the CEO of the A League when it first started, so he believed, you know, he believed in a marquee player being Robbie Fowler, or or Emil Heskey, or Del Piero, you know, that that real marquee players. You know what I mean? Um, and so I follow, I follow, I, you know, we talk about football all the time. He's gone back to Queensland, but I I I really like him involved in the game, but but. Uh, also, so I had breakfast with Archie in Melbourne. I had breakfast with Archie and Claude. Do you know what I mean? Uh, so Claude and I are still are still good mates. But you know, you, you're lifelong. I mean, like um, um, players players that uh, like um, Eddie Campbell, who was a fullback at Brunswick Juventus. I mean, they were champions in '84. But Eddie lives in southern Spain, and um, you know, and we chat and yarn on Facebook and everything else. I haven't seen him for years, but. You know, next time I get to Europe, I'm going to go down and see him have a weekend there. You know what I mean? So this football family, how lucky we are! And I, I honestly believe that the '80s in 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 Australian football was such a unique era. I mean, yes, I played in it. I would say that, wouldn't I? But you know, it, I think it set the foundation up for what was a brilliant soccer uh, soccer team. Because when I played at Melbourne Croatia, Mark Baduka was, I think, 14 year old junior. He was playing, he, like they called him the bomber then. And everyone said, this boy's going to go places because he was a Melbourne, you know, from a Croatian background and out at St. Albans or wherever it was. And, you know, and I remember him as this solid sort of 14 year old. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he'd have been there with his dad watching the NSA. So, and, and a question um, that I have, if there's a 14, 15, 16, 17 year old watching, um, Boy or girl, you play you play football here at the highest possible level. Um, what advice would you give them um, as they're coming through? Because you ended up having a coaching career. But what what would you say to that 14, 15, 16, 17 year old um, aspiring footballer? Well, I think you have to expect to be successful. I mean, if you say if you tell yourself anything else then, you know, it's just not the right signal. You've got to say to yourself, look, I expect to be successful. I expect to be successful. But you also, you know, that, that you get out what you put in is also true as well. I mean, you know, my son Saxon, for instance, um, 
you know, maybe two years ago was ranked third in the country for men's open javelin. And, um, you know, he, he, um, he was getting the odd injury, like third in the country at that age. He's now probably eighth in the country. He wanted to go to the Olympics. He was going to Olympic qualifiers for the javelin and stuff like that. And I said to him, you know, one hung over Sunday morning. He's 25 now, but uh, he's still, he's still in, in the, into the javelin big time, but um, he's injured. And I said to myself, well, three weeks ago on a Sunday, you were trying to recover from a big night out with your mates. I said, no, you've, you've got to get to the table before you can eat. And at the moment, I said, you haven't got to the table. You know, so for instance, you want to go and socialize with your mates and then and, and, and expect every time you go out and socialize with your mates at that level, you may as well set yourself back a month. Mm. Okay. So so do you do you really, really want it? Do you, or, you know, do you really, really want it? I mean, because if you do, you will dedicate yourself to it. You'll have your kit bag ready, you'll have it all ironed and folded. You'll be, you know, you'll get up in the morning and do a stretching routine and do some sit-ups and Every day you're dedicated to the course. I mean, I'm on Facebook or Instagram. I'm connected to Thomas Roller, who's the world champion javelin. He won the won the Olymp uh, Rio. He won the the gold for javelin. I took Saxon to Northern Finland and um, to Cortain to you know where Petiri Pirinen, who's the world's best javelin coach, to give him some coaching. And I said, you won't find Thomas Roller out out on the piss. If you know what I mean. Mm. Um, so look, you can you can you can you can socialize when um, self you can you can socialize when you've made it. Mm. I mean, like you've got to get there first. Yeah, you know. So I think you know when I was between sixteen and, and twenty three, where well, I played a lot of football, I did not drink a pint of beer until I was eighteen to start off with. Mm. Um, I, I didn't. I didn't. Um, you know, I, I was dedicated to try and get somewhere with, with the football. I didn't think, um, you know, oh, it would just it would just happen. I expected to be successful. I expected to be more successful in football than I ended up being. And Tony Vizina would be the first to say, if you had have taken football in Australia more seriously, Gary, um, you probably would have gone back to England after two seasons and picked up a, a much bigger career. I mean, at one stage... I was um, asked, I was going to sign for Tottenham. So that was actually true, hand on heart. I had, a, had an offer from Tottenham and got injured uh, at the wrong time. And in those days, they said, okay, who else are we looking at? Okay, this boy and this boy. So you sort of like a production line of opportunity, then it goes, it goes astray. But, you know, um, I mean, I was in you know, reasonable good mates with Kerry Dixon. They went on to Chelsea and, you know, a bit younger than me, but we used to, practice at Dunstable's ground when we were, you know, whatever. So he went on to, to play for England under Bobby Robson. He went on to be a top goal scorer at Chelsea for several seasons. And I didn't see me being any less a footballer than Kerry Dixon was. Do you know what I mean? But just these sliding doors moments, sort of a sudden you do this. And I thought when I got to Australia, um, oh, well, it's semi-professional. You know, I can, I can relax a little bit. I can probably party a bit more. Um, you know, I'll still, I'll still do well at this level, but um, I really should have. It was, it was only when, when, um, when I was at Arpia that all of a sudden I, I felt real professionalism in, in how Rally was doing things, the coaching staff, the physiotherapy, the treatment, the, you know, the advice, the, the, the board, and how we used to, we used to show what we were going to do and how we we're going to go. This, this is, you know, Football. yeah. This is this is this is really it, but it's too late. So I'm at the end of my career. Anyway, fantastic words of wisdom, Gary Ward. Um, thank you for your contribution to Australian football. It's been an absolute pleasure um, reliving those uh, great moments throughout your career. Well, thanks for having me, Sasha. I mean, this is great fun, and we can talk about the game. I mean, there's there's football on tonight, isn't there? You know. Mm. I mean, I'll just, I'll be, I'll be watching it. Oh, I'll go and watch a game. I mean, you know, you, you just love it. I've got some surgery coming up at the end of this year. They're going to put a disc um, in my, in my L4 and L5 in my spine. Because at the moment, it's just rubbing like crazy and driving me insane down this side. 
Um, and then, according to um, uh, Associate Professor Steele, I should be able to get back on the park. There you go. Maybe an over so fives team, an over thirty fives team uh, might need a prolific goal scorer. How about no, no, that? I'll, I'll be, I'll be I'm an over. No, no, I won't say. <laughs> you get where I'm coming from. Yes. There's a six at the front, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> well, you're looking great. Right, um, well, thanks very thank, much. Thank you very much. Um, you, uh, you, you, uh, you've been a great storyteller, reliving um, your legacy. So thank you. All right, cheers. All the best to you. All the best. Hey, guys. We've come to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to our wonderful guest. If you like this type of content and would like to see more, how about you hit the like and subscribe button and have a fantastic day.